Our next session is the three things your developer portal can live uh, without. So it's basically about some DX. Uh, so as we all know, developers are sometimes very strange creatures. <laughs> we have to please them with the right uh, uh, features, right uh, attitude, and right everything. So uh, we will have Ilona to talk about that. Hi. Hi, Ilona. Yes. Great. Let's Can you try to uh, do the screen screen share as well? Okay. I. How do I do that? Uh, there's a button near the mic button. Uh, it's like a a monitor. Ah, found it. Is this working now? Oh yeah, I, I can't see that the screen share happening. Uh, are you using a Mac right now? Yes. Uh, I think you have to set the, the permission in the privacy uh, uh, in, in system preferences. Um, okay, sorry everybody for this. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, it's, it's all right. Yeah. So okay, at, at the same time when, when, when Ilona is preparing for the for the screen share, uh, I will want to have a quick walkthrough of the uh, Hopin platform. So actually, apart from the developer stage uh, uh, session here, you could try to visit the partners village. There are some booths right there, and you could try to ping people uh, in the people panel that you have uh, the, at the top right corner uh, to connect with people. That's what API Days is about, really. Yeah. So. We would have several more sessions today in the develop, developer stage, so, so uh, stay tuned. Great. This is oh, working. Yeah, out. I could see the screen. Then. Yeah, great, great. So I think we are all set now, Yvonne. I will pass the time to you to talk about uh, the three things your developer portal can't live without. Thank okay. You. So, hi, I'm Ilona. I'm a tech writer on a developer relations team. So when I think about this subject, I'm looking through both of these lenses. Um, Developer portals might belong to another team at your companies, and if so, I want, I'm want i really curious to know what's different for you. This presentation are, is my thoughts about the subject, and I am not representing my employer, just to be very clear on that. This is me, not Twitch, speaking to you. This presentation is not a case for having a developer portal, because I assume that we all have one and we all know why we need it. And it is not only lecture, I've deliberately left time for questions and comments because I very much want to hear from you. So work definition, what is a developer portal? It's the interface between API producers and the API community. Your portal should enable developers to register, explore, consume your API and get support for your API. At a minimum, it should have documentation, forums, blog, tutorials and lifecycle information. Because And so I'm going to go with everybody knows what all of that is and not go deeper. OK, so what are those three things your, your portal needs to have? Accuracy, usefulness, and security. And I'm really sorry I couldn't come up with a clever acronym. Um, but what do these things add up to? That I'll hold off till the end to tell you. So let's start with accuracy. First impressions matter. There's something called the halo effect about decision making. We tend to like or dislike everything, including things we have not observed. Um, so this applies to people, but also applies to things. So if we go to a developer portal and we like what we first see, we're predisposed to like everything about the portal. Um, a good first impression will positively color your later impressions and a, a poor first impression will also make you feel negatively towards the portal, even if it's actually really good. Um, for developers, laziness is a, is a virtue in that they want to write the least code, 
to make the thing work and they want to get information in the easiest way possible so that they can get back to work. They don't want too many clicks. They don't, they want to know what they're clicking on. So you want to make sure your landing page keeps up with the rest of the content feature what's new and improved. Developers can be tough critics and you need to know that about your audience and developers are not quiet when they're not happy. Don't bullshit them, give them facts. Don't give them marketing, speak with them, not at them. So the benefits of accuracy are really pretty obvious. Um, you get a reputation for credibility and your users can be developing faster. And the costs likewise are also pretty darn obvious. It's damage to your reputation and it's damage that can be hard to repair if it's very bad. And an increased learning curve might make developers give up on your product and move on to somebody else's. How do you ensure accuracy? Get reviews. Um, I like to use what I call the 30-90 method, or actually what people call the 30-90 method. When you're 30% done, get reviews for your information architecture and your content in general. When you're 90% done, get reviews for all the details. So when you send things out for the first review, you can tell your users, uh, don't proofread this, just make sure I'm, you know, have things going the right way. Is this organized in a way that you think is good? Reviewers should be people who actually use your API. That's really important. Um, yeah, you might want to have other writers review it, but they don't. They just don't know as much and they don't share the pain of, of somebody who's using it. Have a style guide. Your style guide needs to cover uh, branding, accessibility, inclusivity, grammar and word choice, style and tone. If you localize your documentation, styles for localization, and if not, internationalization, and anything else needed but for your specific industry. Let users know what type of issues are at what severity and how quickly you'll fix each one. What I use for issue types are breaking changes, and by that I mean breaking changes to the documentation, not to the API. Non-breaking changes, feature requests, entire new documents, and small typos and stuff like that. And depending on the severity and how much is hurting the users, things get dealt with in the current sprint, the next sprint, two or three sprints out, and we'll negotiate it. And small typos and stuff like that just go into backlog to get dealt with when there's time. If you don't have an SLA now for your de developer portal, make one and put in the effort to socialize it. Once your users know what to expect, they're a lot calmer waiting for things. So, Usefulness. Usefulness is different from accuracy. Think about these two possible experiences. Here's how to use our APIs in case you're unfamiliar or have limited experience with us. And here's a searchable reference in case you need to look up something specific. Or alternatively, here's literally every word the developers told us about every obscure application of our API. Oh, and a reference because we'll sure you want to read more. One of these is going to get developers using your product and the other one may well drive them away. You can have all the accurate information in the world, but if it doesn't help anybody, there's no reason to have it there. So what makes information useful? Time sensitive, attainable, sustainable, excuse me, accessible, inclusive, and discoverable. And again, this does not make a clever acronym. If anybody out there is good at making clever acronyms, let's collaborate, because I'm not. So time sensitivity, you want to, Ooh, and I found a typo. You want to feature time-sensitive content, breaking news, event information, API uptime, and you want to avoid content delay syndrome. Content delay syndrome is when there are, there'll be, always be complaints, and sometimes they'll be from you, like me noticing my own typo right there, about poor quality content. The reason most content is not properly maintained is that most content plans rely on getting already overworked people to produce, revise, and publish content without neglecting their other responsibilities. Um, you have to recognize that content and publishing tasks are time consuming and they're complex. This needs to be included in job descriptions, performance reviews, and resource planning. Having professional t tech writers is a really good thing. If you don't, you have to know that your developer advocates or whoever else is writing this stuff, that is really part of their job. It's not something they're doing for fun on the side and it needs to be recognized. What's sustainable um, facts? 
you want to update factual content with any new information. And likewise, you want to delete content that's no longer true. Having stuff that's sitting there, but it's no longer used or it doesn't work anymore is just going to like annoy people. And you want to maintain a change log so that people can go to the change log often and see what's changed and just know this. One thing that can help with sustainability is user generated content. Take advantage of it. Have forums, and by the way, if you have forums, you should be participating in them as staff and to make sure every question gets answered. You can open up a means for direct feedback, uh, schedule meetups, go to conferences, whatever works for your company. Someone using your API every day is going to have helpful things to tell you about your dev portal. Okay, accessibility should be obvious. It's 2020. Sadly, it doesn't seem to be obvious everywhere. So here's some bullet points, but this is a whole presentation topic on its own. I've done a lot of research into this. If you want it, let me know. I have a list of resources I can send you. I have more of my own thoughts I can send you. I can put you in touch with real experts on this subject. But, you know, some bullet points on the slide. Ensure that readers can navigate your whole site using only a keyboard without a mouse or trackpad. I have repetitive stress injuries. Lots of people do, and using a mouse sometimes exacerbates it. You want to break up large sections of text. Use white space liberally. It just makes it easier for people to see. Use meaningful link text. Links should make sense when read. You should not say click here. And by the way, meaningful link text also helps your SEO. Um, avoid directional language. Don't, instead of saying the table below, say the following table. If somebody's blind, words like above and below are meaningless. Um, if a link downloads a file, include text to indicate this as well as the file type to be downloaded. Instead of just saying, again, click here, say, click here to download a PDF at that about or the title of it. Um, don't use color, size, location, or visual cues as the main way to deliver information. We're all used to red meaning warning, but if you don't know what red is, that doesn't help, and a screen reader is not going to account for that. Um, so there you go. And also don't, for oh yeah, one last thing, don't force line breaks within sentences and paragraphs. If somebody resizes a window to, or enlarges their text, it might not work well and it might look really ugly. And also once it's when translated, the translators are going to keep the forced line breaks in there and it might not make any sense. Now, I have even more to say about inclusivity than accessibility, and that's largely because it's an even bigger topic. Stay tuned, I'm actually working on a presentation about that. Um, there's, there's a website called the Conscious Style Guide it's kind of your one-stop shop for everything you could ever want to know about inclusivity. But I'm gonna give you a very quick one slide course. Avoid ableist language. It's seldom to never deliberate, but when you're trying to have a friendly tone, problematic language can slip in. It could be figures of speech, it could be nouns, it could be adjectives. Specific words and phrases you could avoid are crazy, insane, lame, blind to, look out for. Um, there's a site called Autistic Hoya it has a comprehensive list of terms to avoid and alternative words to use. And by the way, when, I'm happy to send out my slides and I have the links in the speaker notes. Don't use gendered language. There's no reason to refer to developers gender. Writing in the third person eliminates the issue. And use the third person plural as much as you can. Because if you say developers, they, it's grammatically not awkward. If you have to write in the singular, still use they or there. It might seem awkward, but its usage actually dates back to the 14th century. And I apologize, but this is only for English. I know some of the rules for French and those are the only two. Um, avoid unnecessarily violent languages and images. This may be a specific issue to those of us working with video games, but you might have to write about violent games, but avoid graphically violent or harmful terms don't use screen captures of in-game violence. Use socially conscious engineering terms. You can, it's not that hard to avoid socially charged terms for technical concepts. Um, instead of master-slave, use primary replica or primary secondary. 
instead of blacklist and whitelist, use deny list and allow list. Um, native feature, first class citizen. These are all terms that are outdated or are becoming outdated. And the more we work to avoid them, the better the world will be. Likewise, you should avoid condescending languages. Statements like just install XYZ or simply do X to Y or it's easy to are exclusionary. Easy for whom? These type of statements make assumptions about your readers and it creates the image of an ideal user. They also exclude people who might take them to mean that they're not skilled enough or smart enough to use your content or your technology because if it's not simple for them or it's not easy for them, they might feel like, well, then I can't be doing this. Tools can help. There are a lot of really good online tools to flag language that can be seen as non-inclusive. I like one called Alex, that's alex.js. If you use Sublime Text or Atom or any number of other um, editors, you can actually build it right, right in. And you know, when you don't know, ask. There's lots of people who can help you with this. Okay, and discoverable. You, you wanna pay attention, you want, this is where metrics come in. You want to monitor your site traffic, including bounce rate. People are coming to your site, but are they leaving right away? That's where you get to on-site time. When they come to your site, how much time are they actually spending using the content and which content are they using? And your SEO. Are your SEO efforts paying off? Are users finding the publicly available content? Or are they finding that the content they need is behind a password they don't have and giving up? All of this matters if you want people to be able to use your portal. Okay, next session is next section is security. Um, I started working on this and then I realized that a lot of people know a lot more than I do. And it, first of all, API security, it's extremely important. It's not necessarily the same thing as portal security. You might want people to be able to see your portal but not necessarily able to use your APIs. Um, Scott Morrison from the API Academy lays out these five steps for, to creating an API security strategy, validate parameters, apply explicit threat detection, turn on SSL everywhere, apply rigorous authentication and authorization, and use proven solutions. Um, there's a PDF of this available online, and I'm not going to read it to you. <laughs> so for portal security, again, I'm not a security expert, and I would really rather hear from you what I might have missed so I can learn too. But here's a couple of things to think about, and there's only two slides about this because these are the only two things I've been personally involved with. You know, we all have our preferred search engine and could go out and learn things too, and reading to you somebody else's website just seems like a waste of energy. So, but one of the things you can do is manage your user identities. Um, you know, you might have different levels of security approved users. You might have um, users who have the free product, but users who have the paid product. You might have people with marketing versus developer accounts. And the two ways I've ever worked with this is either using a built-in directory or integrating it with single sign-on. Uh, SSO integration works particularly well, of course, when it's an internal portal. And here we go for managing access permissions. There are three main categories for de developer portals. And one is internal only, and that's only available to your organization's API developers. It's useful for when your API team is testing new APIs on the portal before they're available publicly, or if you're a company that doesn't productize your software, but you still have APIs that your internal developers use. You might have private portal, which are visible to developers with explicit permission granted during registration, or you might have a public portal, which is visible to all registered developers or to everyone, whether or not they register. All of these things are valid, but they all have different security needs. And just a little reminder that internal portals need security too. It enforces consistent access control and it avoids insecure walk workarounds like people sharing API keys over email or other public channels. So, when you have all these things, you get trust. And what does trust get you? Well, first of all, trust gets you engagement. And the way you keep finding out if your developers are engaged is to ask them, send out a quarterly survey, ask them for their satisfaction level. How useful are they finding your content? Proficiency level, 
have them self rate their proficiency level with the product after they use your educational content. If you have tutorials, say, have you used the tutorials? You know, did they teach you how to do that? Did you still have questions? And usage level, that can be self-reported and also seen with statistics and you wanna measure active activity on the portal. You wanna know how many people are actively using it and which parts of your portal they're using. Um, also, what percentage of users maybe used a certain product feature during a given period of time? Maybe you need the mean number of key actions per user. That is, you know, how many times a user performs a key action with your product and the mean time between key actions. Um, the ultimate goal would be to reduce that time because the assumption is that when the time between visits per user is reduced, the feature has more tangible value. And retention. Engaged users become repeat users. Retention means return visits to your portal. You act participation in forums. You could have guest bloggers um, who's using the doc, et cetera. And how can you retain people? Um, reward participation. Keep adding useful new content. Have excellent search. One thing developers do not want to do is read through the docs to find what they need. They want to be able to search it and be the authority on your own doc. It's great that Stack Overflow exists. It's great that Google's out there, but you wanna keep the level of knowledge local. You want users to go to your site first to find out how to do things rather than go to somebody else's. So in conclusion, I'm trying to get to my last slide. There we go. In conclusion, and I thank XKCD for this, if you do things right, it can take people a while to realize that your so-called API documentation is just instructions for how to look at your website. And honestly, now it's your turn. I really want to hear from you. I'm going to stop sharing so we can talk. Great. Thanks, Ilona, for your uh, great introduction about have that experience. So um, I have a quick question for you. So um, actually, how uh, do you have any tips and tricks? How do we motivate developers to write good documents and improve documentation? Because sometimes developers are lazy. They want to write code, but they don't want to write good documentation or make the, the portal experience better. So what are your tips and tricks about that? Well, honestly, there's bribery. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I have been known to keep good whiskey on my desk that developers get to drink while talking to me about Doc. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, seriously, you just want people to understand that documentation is important. And if you write good specs and if you answer my questions, it's actually going to be faster than if I have to keep bothering you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. That's cool. yeah. And, and, also, yeah, yeah. and also, every product, every feature has more than one developer. Find the developer who likes documentation and just work with them and then talk to their manager and say, mm. this person is really helpful. Can Doc be part of their job? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Division of labor, basically. Well, exactly. And because, you know, on some of my products, I have developers who not only like um, writing Doc, they're really good at it. And so it's now part of their job. They're not taking time away from their job to help me with documentation. Yeah. And so it's win-win. Yeah, it's a mindset problem. It's part of your job. It's not, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so another yeah, question. Exactly, but, but you, can't, you can't force developers to write. But if there's somebody who yeah. wants to help you, try to make it happen so that it's easy for them to help you. Great, great. Okay, another question from the floor. Uh, so, about the forums feature that you've mentioned. So apart from uh, another FNU for support requests, do others find developers using uh, product forums? So is it a really fe a feature that developers would use? Uh, Everywhere developers? I've ever worked that had a forum, it was super active. Mm. Because another fact about developers is we like to show off. <laughs> <laughs> and so if somebody asks a question, people are really eager to be the first person to answer it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, you know, you're, bas you're basically appealing to people's nature <laughs> when you have forums. Uh, but it's important to monitor the forums to make sure every question gets answered. 
um, many jobs ago now, best is about 10 years ago, I just noticed that questions were going unanswered in that company's forum. And I was new, I was considerably younger, didn't have a lot of experience. So I made it my business to read the forums and if questions went unanswered, find a developer who could answer it. Yeah, okay. And once 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 people see that you're working with them on the in the forums, they're more interested to use it. It's kind of a happy like cycle. Yeah. Great, great. So, I think it's about time. Thanks Ilona for your Ilona for your amazing walkthrough on 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 topic. So, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And Ilona at ikd.io, let me put that in the chat. Yeah, I think many uh, from you, the audience are, are interested. If you, if you want my slides, the best yeah. way to get them is to email me, although they will eventually, API days will ask for them and they'll all be online. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. So thank, thank you everyone yeah. for being here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>